thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, this evening and to uh, uh, give back to you uh, some of what you've given to us so we can use that to spread the gospel throughout the world and throughout our community. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm so happy and here's the reason why. Jesus took my burdens all away. Now I'm singing as the days go by. Jesus took my burdens all away. Once my heart was heavy with the load of sin. Jesus took my load and gave me peace within. Now I'm singing as the days go by. Jesus took my burdens all away. I'm so happy, I'm so happy here. Jesus took my burdens, he took my burdens all, all away. Now I see singing as the days go by. He took my burdens all away. 
Once my heart was heavy with the load of sin, Jesus took the load and gave me wonderful He's peace within in. my heart. And now I'm singing, singing as, as the days go by. The days go by. Jesus took my burdens, he took my burdens all, all away. Okay, let's see. Let's turn to 303 and let's stand for this one. Glory to his name. forward to Stephen speaking tonight and sharing. Get a break from the pastor. Yeah. Amen. Right? Amen. All right, Stephen, as soon as you're ready. You're ready. All right. Come on up. Oh, good evening. So so good to be back after a while and uh, travel last week. You've been praying for us, uh, specifically for travels, but equally that we are able to add some support and to be able to also get some few things uh, going on for us in the in Nigeria when we get back. So uh, a short story. It's that. We, my family and I, uh, Egla started a school 2019 while I was here, and she started a school. And actually, I should say she's the only started a school uh, without a very good communication with me about that. But <laughs> so, and um, we are very honest about that. So I'm, I'm honest to say that. But I struggle with that because we never arrange our family for to have many people in the property for a long time. And um, I am, I love it, I am a people's person. But when I come home, I truly want to be alone. So, and, and that affected me a lot more. And we were praying over that. And last year, and truly, she knows it, or maybe she didn't know, doesn't know it, but we discussed that. Anything she starts that doesn't have my blessing, she just gets stopped there. It doesn't just go. And this one we discussed, and I said, you have my blessing, and I will support you afterwards. You know, after the Lord dealing with both of us in different ways. And, and I brought that to, to literally just tell you that God answers prayer. On Monday, I had a meeting with a friend who it's now, they were able, it's not, it's not they were able to help that Edla can now move from the property because we were having the kids in the compound with us. Uh, 30 over 30 young P children that will come to do and then be able to be able to give us a startup form that will be able to start up somewhere she can rent an apartment to have the kids there. I wanted to bring that to your notice that the Lord is answering your prayer. So if you've been praying for us, I want to tell you the Lord has answered that. And that becomes something that for us it's a big, big thing, especially in our family. So we wanted to to give you that uh, announcement, but also tell you, keep praying. The Lord works when we pray. Um, 
and I would, well, I will open the scripture, but but just to lay a background to where we are headed this after evening. Uh, it's not going to be a long time, but I will make sure I matched everything that I wanted to say. I won't talk about our ministry now. I really felt led, like I told Pastor Joshua, I will have time to share with you in maps what is going on in Nigeria. He will give me that time. The Lord has allowed that he, he said that. And our last service here is going to be maybe on the 8th of October. That will be our last service, and then we'll be headed back to Nigeria. But, uh, but the more Pastor Josh stands up to preach and open the word, the more I feel like this is what the church needs every day. Gospel-centered community, things that, the, you see, church is not meant for us. And, and, and understanding, this gathering that we are doing here, it's not meant for us, it's, for, it's meant for those who are not here. And our fellowship is, it's, it's, it's unproductive if it is not taken out. We are, we are like, I don't know whether they are called herds or whatever now, of monkeys. Wherever they gather, you cannot plant a tree and it brings out fruit. If we are here and it's just for here. But if we are here, and the purpose of why we are here is that we go out, then we become like herds of cattle, where our meat is productive, our skin is productive, our dung is productive. Whatever that we do, it's productive, and wherever we go, it's productive. That is the, the life of a believer. The life of a believer that in prosperity is productive, in, in adversary is productive on whatever situation that is productive. And so, you know, I say that a longer introduction of where we are headed, and uh, for you to understand that I'm coming alongside what the pastor really was, it's, it's just saying it. I'm only saying it in a Nigerian way, okay? And so, and a lot of what I say I understand. And you may have difficulties in understanding some of the things I say. Don't take it personal, okay? And you would see some unusual passion. Just understand, we are friends. Okay? Nothing wrong. There's passion when we are up. It's not a problem. So let's open, let's open our Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Luke 14, we'll start reading from verse 25. Luke 14, Luke 14, verse 25. The large crowd were gathering along with him, that is Jesus. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, his own father and mother, his wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever not carry his own cross, and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, is not able to finish all who observe it, begins to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build, began to build, and was not able to finish. Or oh, what king, when he sets out to meet another king in a battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the, the one coming against him with, with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he would send a delegation and he will ask for terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possession. Therefore, salt is good, but if even but even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure power. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Father, I pray today that you will allow your word to meet us in the points of our needs, in the points of our struggle 
in the point of our comfort and in the point of our mission. May you also use my words, which are not as powerful as your word, to bring encouragement beyond their expression. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, just just to lay a background, I had already talked about the idea that we understand that the purpose of salt, it's not for salt, right? The purpose for salt is for test, to test good. The purpose of a Christian, it is actually not for the Christian himself. It is the purpose for the Christian is for Jesus Christ and actually for those who do not even know Jesus. So if you would look at it in a very, very, in fact, the sermon that has been going on in, on this pulpit, it is actually a sermon that covers Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all inclusive, to see the life of a believer, of who that believer is. Currently, in our world, we are in the world where you find understanding who is a disciple of Jesus Christ is actually very, very far-fetched. It is, we are in a situation where we don't even know who is Christian or who is not a Christian. Not even because of the point number one that Paul, that the pastor was talking about this morning, the point of purity, not even on that, but even the point of conviction. There is no conviction. We are in a generation where conviction is counted, where conviction it is even looked at as weakness, where whatever you believe, it is actually said that what you believe, it is nothing. You can play around in the flexibility with flexibility in the issues of your belief. You and I know that after being convicted to be a Christian, then you are converted. And after the conversion, that conviction holds you for life and eternity. It is one thing you have, you went into, and then another thing, that thing captures your entire life. And it's the same picture Jesus Christ was giving here. Sitting down with many, many crowds, and he's saying, you want to say you know me, you want to say you belong to me, but I want to bring it to your notice, that after saying that you love, you love me, and you belong to me, you are no longer your own. You are no longer owning it. You lost it in everything that would have called achievement. You've lost it in anything that would have called rights. Of course, America is a, it's a country of rights and privileges. I want you to know that it's not like that when it comes to your faith in Christ. You have the right that you've submitted to the hands of Jesus. And as we can see that, have you ever thought about how, you know, uh, the statistics in the world has changed. We have more divorce rates as in the world and as in the church in the same paradigm, now power. It used to be that the marriage proof, the marriage proof that the relationship is a Christian relationship. Currently, it's not so. It used to be that anyone that answers the name of Jesus Christ is that person that will never cheat at you. It's not a person that will never take advantage of your life. You and I know that we have to now go to the Lord for mercy. That is not what's going on. So there are many areas we can see in your in our country, in both your own country, but also in my own country, that is completely a lack of allegiance, lack of commitment, lack of conviction of what we believe. And Jesus Christ at this time, he was taking disciples from one stage of come to another stage of follow me and to another stage of I am the light and for another stage of okay, now since you say you love me and you belong to me, these are the things that can happen in your life that literally will authentify that you are learning under me. It is not to say that he, can, he will drive them away, but he is saying there are levels of commitment. If you really want to pride yourself that you are somebody who can literally live in obedience with God and, and 
no matter what is going on, I rather have Jesus than thousands of applause. I rather have Jesus than names than silver and gold. I rather have Jesus than even my health. I rather have Jesus than anything about that. This is where he's saying that if you really know me, you love me, these are the I rather have that you would have. Many of you, we are the second generation Christian in Nigeria. My wife and my wife, um, myself and my wife and everyone in our age. You are probably the fifth, sixth or the tenth generation Christians. I, my granddad, all of them, they grew up, we saw them coming up from paganism into Christianity or from Islam into Christianity. And their children, which are my, our parents, led them to the Lord. But you cannot even tell how many genealogies that were Christians before you at that point. So you could see that you have also a, a, a line, but you know, from the foundation to be able to tell who is a Christian and how Christianity was passed down to you and that idea. So Jesus Christ defined commitment. He defines conviction to be his disciples as not unto a thing, but unto a person. If you say that you believe in God, it's not a belief of belief, but it's a belief in a person. And he said, if you want to follow me, it's not a follow, it's not a set of, set of rules. You know that we are very good at ticking the box. I may live, never lie. I may live, never cheat. I may live, never take advantage. I may live, never gossip. I may do, I may check all the boxes. But if I'm checking the boxes for the boxes, then I have not actually met the real thing. And he was saying there that the real person here is the Jesus. And he said, if you are committed, it will be about me, not about the rules. So commitment into as a community of faith, living as a disciple of Jesus Christ on the street that we found ourselves on the places of work here, it's that we are committed to Jesus. It is not committed to Christianity. Controversial as it will sound, you should be committed to Christ, not even Christianity. Because your Christianity, Pastor George made a statement two weeks ago, you know your Christianity will tell you who, can talk, who you could talk with and who you will not talk with. Your Christianity will tell you how to dress and actually how you, do, you can, you can, you can uh, 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 what do they call it now, profile how people should be. That is your Christianity. But your Christ will tell you different. He will tell you that he is more concerned with what is going on in your heart. What is the transformation that is happening in your heart? Are you keeping the outside like a whitewash tomb? Or in the inside, it's as bright and clear. I was reading a statement in a devotion by, I think, Paul David Tripp. He says something that in the world that we live today, that there is a lot of chaos that outside, while people may be even thinking, somebody who has deep-seated belief in Christ, but the world is really bolstering, and, and uh, sorry, the world is in chaos, and you may think that they are in chaos, but only if you know them, you will know that in their inside, they are renewed. Paul said that in the book of 2 Corinthians. He said we were beaten, we were, what, whatever, they were ever, whatever that you would have thought bad happened, happened to him. But he said that every day we are being renewed. That is a person that is conviction is laid on Christ. So commitment to our faith and to the person whom we believe is Jesus Christ. All over the world, people always commit to things. We sit down in UN, we commit to peace. We sit down in the World Commonwealth, we commit to money, right? We sit down in the White House, we commit to democracy. We sit down in everywhere, it is just about a thing. Look at, you would even imagine all the things that are going on in the world, you would even think people are fighting for people. No, they're fighting for their pockets, and they're fighting for their power and authority. And Jesus Christ is saying, no, in this point, 
I want you to move into a place of committing yourself to the person. Jesus, he wants to be the person. That is the person. You know, I like the trials, the trials that was happening because it was around a person. That person, God, Jesus Christ, God manifesting himself in Jesus, being the authority of our life. i rather have Jesus. Now, that is very powerful. That is the only thing that can change it. Every doctrine, every belief, every whatever that we're doing, how it's your intimacy with your Lord Jesus Christ. So commitment is demonstrated as we've shown here. He said that commitment is voluntary. Look at the word that he used there. Jesus used it. Verse 26. He said, if. Why would you say if? Because you can actually come into the fold, but you are not committed. Do you know that I was reading the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation? Last year I did that. This year I'm not. Last year we did that twice actually. Uh, two, two times in a year. And last year I never saw a place where God forced a man to do a thing. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful, but also scary? He always plays choice before man, and then he will give him the superlative. He will give him, this is the way, but you have the right to take the other way. And same, Jesus came with that. Jesus said, look at the last verse there. The verse, the verse 30, 35. He said, he who has ears, let him what? Let him hear. Is there anyone without a hair? An ear? All of us have ears. Why is the if there? It is because commitment to that person, Jesus, is voluntary. The more you commit, the matured you are. The more you don't commit, the more immature you are. Do you know that the sign of maturity in Christianity is actually willingness to give? Willingness to surrender. Let me give you an example. When you have small children, who do you feel that you can control easily? Uniformly. You tell adults, stand up, almost every adult will stand up. Children, few would hear, small would, a number percentage would be able to understand, and then stand up, you will see some sitting. When you meet teenagers, the percentage will reduce. When you meet adults, more people will be standing. In fact, if they are all healthy, all of them would what? Would stand. Maturity is actually the having the right to disobey, but refuse to disobey, but yield. That is the sign of maturity. And Jesus Christ is saying right in here that the sign of maturity is knowing that you have the right not to do it, but you are doing it anyway. Why? Because you believe in a person that defies your disobedience. What a wonderful scripture to see that even Jesus brought that to us. Commitment is tough. It touches our emotions. He said, he said there, right there in that verse again, he said, he said it's the place where if you would touch your emotions, your rights, your privilege, it touches your, 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 your sense of calculation. Some of us here, we are very good in calculations. We bring the numbers and tally them together. Commitment literally touches how you call, calculate things. And how you do things. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12 verse 1. He said, I therefore beseech you brother, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of service. And I, I, I love this verse. And there is an insight. I, I was getting it from my younger brother Simon. He preached about that. And he talks about that. He said that you present your body. He said that you present your bodies. But when it comes, he said that reasonable act of service, not services. Why would he say service, but not services? 
since you are sacrificing bodies, but he is now talking about service. The singular fact is that you are, all of us, we are doing a commitment unto one person. And everything that we do as a community of faith, it is actually channeled towards that one person, Jesus Christ. So commitment is common sense. Sit down and calculate. Commitment is costly. Forsake your parents. While some people can live, I, I like your culture. You know, uh, I like your culture because you can give out everything that you have to be where your parents are whenever the needs, your needs are around. Isn't that wonderful? It is good. It is really great. And God is actually saying that's your responsibility to do it. You find that somewhere it's parents that give up for their children and on the final there's some instances. Children, you're giving up for that as your culture doing that. It's common sense. But you see that. But God, it's, Jesus Christ wasn't saying you should hate your parents or hate your children. He's saying in comparison, in comparison between the love that you have for Jesus Christ and the love that you have for parents, you can really say, ah, you've never even seen anything yet. He loves God. Oh, he bought a car for his father. He bought this for his father. He did this for his father. And somebody said, oh, is that what you are thinking? You've not even seen anything like it. Look at the way he sacrificed for God. And then you will now say, oh yeah, that's true. That is the point that Jesus Christ was making here. And that is actually the love that we can see in the community that guides us. Commitment is imperative. It touches our effectiveness. If we are committed as a body of Christ, there is a reward and it's evident. So let me take you back to a story that Jesus Christ was giving, that he gave a story. And it's very, very funny when you read that story, Matthew 25. It talks about two individuals, three individuals, five talents, three talents, and one talent. And he said that in the one talent, that every other person did everything good. But in the one talent, he dug the ground and hid it. And what did he tell them at the last? He said, get that talent and burn him. Take him where there's gnashing of teeth and, 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 and deal with him over there. What would be the reason that Jesus Christ would do that? And, and that's the point of effectiveness. When he said, when Saul loses it on test, if Christianity exists in North Branch, but there is no impact, we are like the person with one talent. If Christian, if a Christian is in your family and that Christian has no effectiveness, that is a person with one talent. What is the idea there? The idea is that there is no hidden Christian. We are living in Nigeria where they, you find out the idea of hidden Christians, right? They say that there are Christians that they are hiding. And we always say that there is no way a Christian can be hidden. It is not even made possible. Read the Bible, you will see. It's not hidden. They will say they, were, they are hiding. They go to pray with Muslims and do whatever. We will always stand the ground and say, if a Christian met Jesus, he can't hide it for six months. It will show. How about many of us here and all of us? In our families, have we met God? Have we met Jesus? Is that showing? Or we are like the salt that has lost its taste? Or we are like others that have probably, they are Christians and they are no more? Commitment also is costly. It may cost us our lives, persecution. I don't know how you are able to deal with issues of how people harass you because you're a Christian, how people, the post-Christian thing that is going on in the world, not only here, I don't know how you are able to take it, but that's the cost of being the, 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 the disciple of Jesus Christ. He said, carry your cross. And I know you know that very well. That somebody's cross could actually be your last fight. 
But what is becoming a difficulty for someone else? It's not your cross. This is not your cross. Everyone here has different cross. It may be relational issues that are your cross. It may be money issues that are your cross. It may be how to be able to get along with people that are your cross. There are many things that could just be there that are your cross. But Jesus Christ said, I mix all of this. I want you to know that let the cross be that you want to please me. That let the cross be that you love me. Let the cross not be that you are fighting for a vain thing. And that is why Paul talks about it very well in Galatia. He said that God forbid it that like I'm, I'm a man just munching an air and then just boxing the air. I should be able to do it like a man really fighting the good fight of faith. He capitalized that in, in, in Philippians 3 verse 10. He said, that, but for I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of suffering with him. And it's an idea that comes up from the idea that we know that our faith, it's not easy believism. Our faith as a community, it is not supposed to be like cookies in a jar. We open and take. No. It is our faith comes with a lot of strength in it. But you know what? There is no peaceful human like you. Do you know why you would suffer so much and you would worry and worry and worry and get depressed because somebody looked down on you? Do you know why? It's because you have not aligned yourself to the suffering of Jesus. You know, let me let me be very let me be very practical. So and then forgive me if that is touchy for you, but that's because I don't know your culture. But let me be very honest with you. You can never do racism to me and it will touch me. Even if I know it is. Same with many of my white friends in Nigeria. Racism doesn't touch them. There's racism in Nigeria. Just being honest with you. Because do you know what? You are moving on the street and kids are coming just calling white man, white man. You know that is no good, right? That is no good. You go down downside you see that and I'll always tell people that it's wrong that it's wrong but it's same <laughs> it, it doesn't touch me because it doesn't change anything about me you understand the idea that is who a Christian is with someone let them call you a big one because I call you a big one then what are you a big one no wake up you appear on the cross what is it? Call me a bigot. I'm not a bigot. Sit me down with you and you know you are the one, not me. Why is it that we so flippancy? We, we allow that we are working with a fragile mind. If you have already been convicted by the gospel, which is that your sin, no man, no man can make you any worse sinner. Amen. Amen. I'm not sure you understood what I'm saying. Maybe there's a cultural issue here. I told you that there's passion will come out a little bit. See, let me tell you this. Nobody knows a better and a worse sinner than myself to myself. And nobody can tell me that. So if somebody comes and gives me another name that is you are thinking that is a bad name of a sinner, you don't even know anything yet. You don't even know. You don't know. It's only me and my savior that knows. And he cannot touch me. I would walk. I know of what the God has done in my life. You, you know, feeling, feelings. It's only feelings that can quench feelings. Facts doesn't change feelings, right? In some essence. But that's where the devil gets it wrong for our faith. Our faith is costly. Perseverance, trusting upon the Lord. Let me read for you in closing something that one of our, uh, one of a missionary and I believe it's an American missionary. He founded a church in Zimbabwe. And he talks about it as a community, a Christian community man that was convicted by his sin and he went to plant a church. He said, I am a part of a fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped out of the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I won't look back. Let up, slow down. 
back away or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secured. I am done and I'm finished with low living, sidewalking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, colorless dreams, tame vision, mundane work, cheap living, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, it, or popularity. I don't have to be right or first or top or recognized or praised or rewarded. I live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by, by patience, lift, lift by prayer, and labor by the Holy Spirit power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road may be narrow, my way rough, my companion few, but my guide is reliable, and my mission is clear. I will not be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice or hesitate in the presence of adversary. I will not negotiate at the table of my enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or media in the midst of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, or let up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and preach up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must give until I drop, preach until all know, and walk until he calls me home. And when he comes home for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear. Amen. Amen. Who do you want to become? Disciple of Jesus or among the disciples? Who do we want to become in North Branch? What is the North Branch goal you have? Your family goal you have? Because you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. There are things you should be known in your family, on your street, because of Jesus. Even when you don't have God to say it, but they will say, this one is a Christian and he always does this to us. Let them not just say you are a good man, but let them be say you are a godly man. Amen? Amen. Yes, there's a difference between a good man and a godly man. Let them just say that you are just a Christian. Let them say that you are a Christ-centered person, living, taking up your cross, giving up your rights. There are many shameful things that we hear, many things going on, people going to courts and, and slicing themselves and unbelievers, things that believers used to solve to before. They are like astronomically big issues now to solve. Our faith gave us the right to solve every issue. But when we became weak, impure, then we now needed somebody else with the worldly thing. Be charged and, be, and just know that we are all in God's presence to be able to live out this faith that he has us. A community of believers living a communal life a God, Christ, cross-centered Christianity. Thank you. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I may not express it like you wanted it today, but you know, Lord, that our heart is towards pleasing you, is towards becoming like you, Jesus, as we make others know you. May you, O oh Lord, just allow these words to sing in our hearts and in our homes. And we pray for even the offering, that you would bless it, Lord, and, and, and give wisdom how that is spent. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'll stand 254 in the court.
sing this chorus. Thank you. 